Good morning and welcome to this UK India Business Council webinar on India from fragile to firm. My name is Aina Gupta, Research and Communications Executive at UK India Business Council, and I will be moderating this session. Even as the global economy stuttered in 2015, the Indian economy was characterized by resilience and strong fundamentals. India has been rightly described as a bright spot in an otherwise gloomy global economy. Over the last two years, the government and RBI have constantly been in action to enforce key reforms, stabilize the economy, and revive industrial sentiment. Going into 2016, India aims to build on its trends, enabling a transition from a bright spot to a shining star on the global horizon. In this webinar, we will discuss the outlook for India, the world's second most populous economy and the fastest growing major economy. Before we begin, I would like to familiarize you with the toolbox on the right hand side of your screens. Just to let you know, everyone will be on mute during the course of the webinar. But if you do have a question, please type it into the little bracket on your toolbox in the Please type your question here section to send this to me and I will take it up during our question and answer session at the end. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Shubhita Rao, Chief Economist at Yes Bank, our speaker for today's webinar. With a PhD in economics from the University of Mumbai, Dr. Rao brings with her over 25 years of experience in academia and industry. At Yes Bank, she is responsible for the economics knowledge banking, which was ranked among the top three forecasters for India in 2013 by the global boomerang Bloomberg Markets magazine. I would now like to welcome Dr. Shubhda Rao for her insights on the economic outlook of India. Uh, thank you, Aina, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Aina has given you a brief background about how India appears to be the most promising uh, destination for growth uh, in the midst of the huge global uncertainty and volatility that we have been witnessing, especially since the start of 2015. And this has unfortunately continued right through the month of January in 2016. In fact, the uh, uncertainty regards global growth from various pockets of regions, be it advanced economies or the emerging markets or the BRICS nations, uh, most of the regions are, are uh, looking towards a larger degree of uncertainty accompanied with greater degree of financial market volatility across asset classes. Amongst this huge sea of un uh, concerns about growth and uh, prospects going into 2016 as well as 2017, uh, India at this juncture looks a better bet as far as growth prospects are concerned. Next, please. Uh, if, we, if we look at the presentation here, uh, we have seen that since the global financial crisis of 2009, uh, most of the uh, regions and the world GDP as a whole has failed to accelerate beyond 3.5%. In fact, in the recent five years, it has mainly disappointed on the downside. Uh, next, please. Uh, however, if you go to uh, see the tracking of India versus the global growth, the line shows you that for a large part of this period, we have seen India growth premium always been uh, over about 3% as compared to what the global growth has been. And as a result of enjoying this growth premium of at least 3% and in the recent times almost coming into 4%, uh, we have seen India grow in its stature and has emerged as the seventh largest economy in dollar terms as per the ranking presented by IMF. Uh, this uh, uh, raising its own stature in terms of uh, economic prospects 
is has been essentially possible because of the consistent improvement uh, in India's macroeconomic uh, uh, scenario. Next, please. Particularly when we talk of growth and inflation, which are the short-term dynamics. But more importantly, if you look at structural dynamic story for India, India is probably the only nation which will continue to have the largest share of the young working age population right until 2040 or 2050. And that implies in turn that India's dependency ratio, that is the people, the senior citizens uh, ratio to working age population is going to continuously decline over the next three decades and only gradually rise by 2050. What it basically implies is that India is going to be a sequentially and significantly a consuming as well as saving nation. So the positive demographic story that India presents is unique, unlike its peers which China until about uh, five years ago was enjoying the demographic dynamics the way India is projecting to grow over the or enjoy over the next two or three decades. Uh, so we have seen that amongst BRICS nations, which were purported to be the growth engines for uh, uh, the world post the Lehman and the global financial crisis, uh, of which only India stands out uh, in a strong story. And why is it so? How do we say that India's demographic provides a great consumer's market as well as a market which would perhaps uh, provide adequate savings to perhaps even going forward fund global growth. Next please. If we, have, if we pay attention to some of the key parameters, be it the automotive segment, the auto, automobiles market, India is currently the fifth largest automobile producer and is expected also to be the third largest uh, both in terms of consumption by 2020 as has been uh, uh, indicated by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, it is also uh, the largest telecommunications market. Uh, India's density, tele-density over the last 10 years has very dramatically risen by almost 25% in a very short span which actually makes it to almost 1 billion users as per the official statistics. Uh, and the third indicator that I would like to point to you is the internet uh, user base, where India is obviously the most fastest growing uh, 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 you know, population using the internet uh, uh, as, as a, a, a platform. As India is more a knowledge-based economy, India's population is geared towards using technology platform, not just for markets, but even for uh, various sectors to use this platform. Internet usage in India uh, augurs extremely well for growth multipliers to shape up going forward. Uh, to go back a little bit to why I said India is the only bright star at this point in time where we have a global mayhem in the markets, if we look at just the recent history of last week, not just the last month, but the last week, we have seen systematic uh, uh, annihilation in some of the equity markets, in some of the other asset classes like uh, currency markets or even the bond markets. So given this kind of uncertainty, uh, I would like to take you as to why we call India the best story uh, in the current scenario. Next, please. Um, as I said, from global financial crisis of 2009, uh, India has come really a long way in setting its domestic house in order with respect to its major macroeconomic parameters. To quickly take you through this presentation, uh, India's growth, uh, you know, soon after the global financial crisis had touched as low as 5%, but quite clearly over the last three or four years, particularly last two years, if I may say so, the growth prospects have sequentially improved. And in the current fiscal year, which India has between April to March, in the current fiscal year, which will close in March 2016, India's growth is going to be somewhere between 
seven and a half to eight uh, percent, which is almost a three and a half percent jump. I don't think any other economy has enjoyed so. The key problem point for India used to be sticky inflation at double digit levels and which we witnessed until three years ago. Over the last two years in particular, we have seen the inflation measured by consumer price indices very sharply see a dramatic correction by almost six and a half percentage points. Uh, I'll come to that a bit later, but the greatest success story for India has been reigning in two of its problem areas. One of them is consumer inflation from 12% levels to 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 levels. And second, India's uh, uh, compulsive uh, dependence on its imports and therefore its negative spillover on the current account deficit, that is, uh, India imports much more than it, ex it exports as a result of which we need to buy dollars in the market perpetually. And this ratio of the current account deficit to the GDP had risen as high in, uh, to 4.7%. In quantum terms, it would indicate somewhere around $80 billion or thereabouts. Now, clearly, where global risk of environment prevails, it's difficult to imagine India attracting $85 billion. However, this was, as I said, three years ago that we had this uh, concern. In this year, and over the last two years, we have seen this ratio dramatically drop to about one to one and a half percent range, which in quantum terms would imply just under $30 billion. And this, in our opinion, India is very comfortably placed to, to be able to attract capital flows to the extent of at least $30 billion by just one head, which is the foreign direct investment. Uh, India has simultaneously been restoring its budget uh, finances, the government's finances, the budget deficits, which had risen very sharply uh, due to stimulus programs post the global financial crisis, have systematically and consciously brought down its deficit levels to under 4%. And uh, with all these, I think the additional feather in the cap has been India's resilience in terms of uh, withstanding any global and external pressures, particularly in manifesting in currency markets, by India's strong resolve to build uh, reserves, which, to my mind, uh, have risen, uh, you know, almost by a hundred billion dollars post the global financial crisis. So this basically provides you a snapshot of how India has transitioned from being one of the uh, fragile five, as it was getting coined uh, around the time of 2013, and over the two years, a short span, how India has been able to. Uh, significantly transform its domestic macroeconomy. Next, please. As I said, all these macroeconomy uh, pressure points have begun to show the vulnerabilities and manifest the vulnerabilities in the currency markets. So if you look at this chart, where uh, most of the emerging market economies saw an average depreciation in their respective currencies up to 15%, in the year where the problem had been most severe, which was 2013 for India, India's currency saw a depreciation of as much as 30% to the dollar. However, the two years hence, with domestic macros very strongly in place, India's currency remained an outperformer in the year 2015, where we saw a continuing pain for most of the emerging market currencies where depreciation was uh, you know, to the tune of almost 19%, India's depreciation was very uh, sharply and spectacularly, if I may add so, contained under 5%. Uh, notwithstanding this very recent volatility that we have seen uh, uh, in continuity from 2015 to 2016, I must add that India has in recent months or so, particularly in the last one month or two or three weeks, India has given up some bit of gains in the currency market, but that is, to my mind, more a manifestation of what's happening in the global financial marketplace, particularly in the currency space, and India being one of those, one of those uh, economies in the region where competitive currencies will drive the export performance, India's 
currency to some extent has uh, moved in a sympathetic or symptomatic move as some of the regions have, particularly in the last uh, few weeks or last couple of months. Next, please. As I said, one of the key reasons why we did very well is inflation management. Inflation management has been possible uh, for primarily two reasons. One, of course, we all know how the global commodity prices have crashed and India's significant dependence on oil has resulted in a very sharp and dramatic decline in uh, the oil import bill and therefore it's a, a reflection on the fuel inflation. But I, I must add here that not all of that commodity price decline has been passed down by the government uh, uh, by, by the government uh, in, in terms of uh, reduced prices of fuel products to the consumers. India has, the government has raised uh, excise duties uh, as, as a cushion uh, going forward in a scenario if the commodity prices uh, uh, rise over the next few months or years the probability of which has dimmed very significantly in recent weeks, but the government of India does have that cushion uh, by uh, reducing excise duties should the commodity-led inflation flare up in India again. The second more important point was on food inflation. India has seen two dramatically bad monsoon years, that is, India's rain-fed irrigation, uh, rain-fed agriculture sector uh, has performed a, a very in a suboptimal fashion as a result of it. Two failed monsoons implied low agriculture output. As a result, we had seen the risk and the potential of food inflation flaring up to over 12 to 15 percent. However, the positive surprise was with government's very debt handling of the food economy by offloading the surplus stocks of food, particularly in staples and like rice and wheat, and also uh, by administrative measures uh, like anti-hoarding activities getting severely penalized. India has been able to contain food inflation below 6% despite two bad years of monsoons. Next, please. <coughs> The second success story for India's domestic has been the dramatic turnaround in the current account gap, as I said earlier. As I mentioned, I'm not going to dwell much on it. I have already spoken that India's current account gap, that is its dependence on global savings, had risen very sharply to almost 5% to GDP ratio, has very significantly corrected for the current year. We expect it to correct as much as uh, to 1% or thereabouts, and into the next fiscal year, starting April 2016, we expect it to correct uh, or remain range-bound at about 1, 1 to 1.5%. What this implies is that India is going to enjoy uh, uh, some kind of resilience from the global shocks and vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerabilities uh, particularly where global risk appetite and capital flows, therefore, are concerned. Next, please. We have seen one of the reasons uh, that has been plaguing the uh, global economy and particularly the uh, emerging markets have been the huge debt pileup that most of the emerging markets economies have been witnessing. Uh, if you look at the chart on the right, uh, you have economies like Brazil and Russia where the debt pileup has been significant uh, in comparison if you look at India, India has seen a very, very mild pickup, and as a result, we have not seen a debt as being a bigger concern for India, particularly at a time when rest of the uh, emerging markets and BRICS nations in particular have seen some of the stress building up because of the huge debt pileup. A short point here that there have been large concerns being uh, uh, expressed about the asset quality in some of the sectors in the Indian banking space. 
I would like to add here that this is a work in progress. India is in the process of cleansing the balance sheets with Reserve Bank of India facilitating that and in, in, in a global or, or rather in our domestic economic cycle that we are in, we have probably seen uh, as much of pressure until now going forward as the government begins to address the root cause of these build up in bad assets by addressing the key concerns in the power sector and in the commodity space. And also the RBI's dispensation, the central bank's dispensation towards the banking sector. We believe that going forward uh, in the next two years, uh, you know, India is definitely going to see very strong balance sheets. In a globally relative uh, speaking space, India's banks still provide a great deal of comfort. I would like to add that here in India, the domestic, within the domestic banks, India's private sector banks still remain extremely robust and resilient as compared to its uh, counterparts in the uh, public sector banking space, the government-owned banking space. But overall, if I were to look systemically, the issue is probably peaking now and going forward, we are likely to see these concerns ebb. Next, please. Uh, the third pillar where India has done extremely well has been improvement in the government's spending, government's fiscal consolidation. Government is spending less and less on wasteful uh, uh, items like subsidies and government is spending much more on productive uh, expenditure which is basically capital spending for its projects. Uh, remember over the last few years where the global demand has been weakening sequentially as also the India's domestic households getting into order, we have seen investment appetite uh, within India weaken over the last few years. In absence of private sector appetite, we saw government step in and uh, improve its uh, capital expenditure that is spending on uh, sectors within infrastructure, within defense, energy, shipping, uh, uh, even areas and sectors like food processing, uh, mining, simulation, aviation, all these sectors have seen a sharp pickup in government-sponsored capital spending, which going forward should augur well and crowd in private sector investment o over the next uh, five or six quarters. We could see a more uh, robust and a sustainable sign of growth pickup uh, come in. Next, please. One of the one of the benchmarks that we like to track is how has the policy uncertainty index been doing? Uh, you may be well aware and familiar with some concerns until 2012-2013 about India's policy dislocation, about India's inability to carry out reforms to restore its uh, uh, sustainable and potential growth. Uh, uh, must like must add here and would like to add here that over the last two years, if you look at the chart, this line shows a very declining trend, particularly over the last two years, and it's essentially because the government has uh, uh, spelled out a very comprehensive program across board to improve India's policy environment, be it in uh, ease of doing business, or be it in imparting strength to India's demography by embarking on financial inclusion, or making the growth more inclusive by allowing uh, larger emerging corporates right up to the medium and small enterprises to be able to thrive with easier uh, funding availability, uh, labor constraints uh, sequentially being looked at to be removed, uh, labor uh, um, quality of labor supply uh, being aimed to be improved by skilling and reskilling the a vast labor force that India enjoys at this point in time. So across board, India has been uh, embarking on a long-term growth agenda without getting tempted for shock bursts, although they may appear very strong in the near term, but would perhaps put a, raise a question about their sustainability. And therefore, India has chosen wise and chosen well to choose the policy mix of enabling and creating an environment which is more sustainable and achievable over medium to long term. Next, please. A quick look at 
what are the pillars of policy that uh, the government of India is working and working very actively on uh, are very clearly India enjoys the huge uh, uh, advantage of being uh, in having or possessing natural entrepreneurial skills and which is what is going to be tapped by India in a very organized manner. Uh, you may have heard in recent times India's forays and initiatives towards Make in India and Make in India is essentially uh, a platform to invite the global manufacturing facilities to set up shop in India to be able to take advantage of cheap labor, relatively uh, predictable capital uh, availability and also a policy environment which is only getting better. Most of the sub-national governments within India are in a race towards creating the most conducive environment by working on the key parameters to remove the constraints on ease of doing business, both for domestic businesses as well as the global businesses which desire to set shop in India. As I talked of, Skill India is going to be another platform where India would be embarking on skilling and reskilling India's huge labor force, improve the productivity of the labor while it uh, has a potential on a relative scale if I were to look at other uh, 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 economies, India's labor productivity uh, uh, matches well. In the very recent, in the near past, you may have heard our Prime Minister launch the hugely successful initiative called Startup India. Now this is nothing but just honing and harnessing India's natural advantage in harnessing technology to create business and growth multipliers. India has been exporting most of its capital and not capital, I'm sorry, most of its labor in Silicon Valley to, uh, you know, make forays into uh, um, most of the technology giants of the world. What India envisages to do is probably uh, over the next one or two years, look at a lot of the business coming into India. As I talked of, ease of doing business is going to be the next pillar where India has been very seriously working on inclusion and governance, uh, creating better ecosystem, better governance facilities, uh, gov uh, also transparency and predictability in our legislation. All of these are key pillars that India has been working over the last one and a half years. And I must like to add that all of these have begun to gradually manifest in our a move up in the global indices of ranking uh, uh, produced by the World Bank in ease of doing business. Of course, we have significant room to improve, but the fact is, after remain, remaining stagnant for many years, over the last two years, we have seen the jump up in our improvement uh, by almost 10 to 20 places in various indices. What we go, are going forward going to be looking for is uh, in less than a month, on the 29th of February, India is going to announce its budget, which is a big event as far as India's economy is concerned. This is the time where India uh, redefines its uh, legislations, uh, not legislations, the steps and the measures regarding its tax framework, uh, announces and introduces new flagship programs for growth and development, and also, in a way, lays down the short-term agenda where, for where India's economy is headed. We are going to look at, over the next uh, uh, year or so, announcements related to continuity in budget, uh, uh, arithmetic and uh, fiscal consolidation. We're likely to see government's strong resolve to improve the domestic demand if it becomes very necessary, particularly in a scenario where we are looking at very weak global demand conditions. At such time, India needs to strengthen its domestic demand, both for consumption as well as investments. Uh, we are also going to embark on a landmark bill, hopefully, which will be introduced and passed in the House of the Parliament in near term, which, to my mind, will be the biggest a reform over a last decade or so, which is on the goods and services tax, whereby India is planning to get on to migrate onto one single tax across the geography, thereby unifying the domestic markets, and which in turn will help 
government not just get better taxes, but over a medium term also help in GDP growth getting better by almost a percentage and a half, uh, remove anomalies of distribution which will help in inflation management and set up shop for manufacturing companies, any part of geography without, uh, you know, just looking at tax implications. So overall, going forward, the three key legislations that we are looking forward to, which we will see the passage of in the near term, is goods and services, more reforms as far as land acquisition and labor are concerned, bankruptcy code, which India still does not have, and hopefully we shall see that. In the past, we have seen big bang reforms. Next, please. Uh, two slides away, please. One more. Next, please. Foreign direct investment, we have seen in the recent past, announced, government announced huge, uh, huge uh, uh, opening up of most of the sectors, uh, construction, uh, coal mining, defense, media, agriculture, banking, and railways being the key sectors, uh, as, I, as I have been talking about, these are the sectors where India plans to attract a lot of global investments, create job opportunities, uh, allow the uh, you know technology needed inflows thereby to come in. Uh, I next please. Uh, I will not talk over the next slide because I've already spoken about ease of doing business, where India needs to get even better. But the sum and substances, the short-term measures and the long-term measures will enable India not just to create better eco ecosystems to invest in, but also unleash a very healthy competition among states to uh, attract global capital as, as well as the domestic investment capital into their respective regions. Next please. We have already seen some of these manifesting in, in uh, actual translation of investment. We saw not too long ago, a um, few months ago, Foxconn, the manufacturer of Apple's iPhones, announced the creation and setting up of facilities in India. We saw automotive giants wanting and creating a uh, space which already are in existence, but they're enhancing of investments, be it Mercedes, BMW, or Renault. Uh, we have begun to see a lot of pipeline of investments into defense space, aviation, and railways. Uh, so overall, the, quite clearly, the investment climate seems to getting better uh, enough to start uh, and uh, initiate a lot of these firms already getting into uh, India to set up their manufacturing facilities. As I talked of earlier, we do have a lot of uh, uh, reforms on track going forward, be it on, on uh, you know, the areas as, which are roads in hard infrastructure or renewable energy, uh, as well as some of the areas which are particularly related to mining and urban infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, to put it in a nutshell, uh, if I were to summarize uh, the presentation of uh, 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 India as uh, emerging to be uh, a shining star, the three key messages that I would do, uh, uh, like to share with you is, one, that India is probably one of the only or only economy which has seen a very uh, dramatic uh, transformation in improving its domestic macros. Two, it has systematically over the last two years uh, resolved some of the domestic policy issues and uh, continues and intends to uh, uh, improve sequentially over the next two, three years in creating even a better policy environment. And three, most important is uh, uh, an economy which uh, uh, spells a very sound macroeconomic stability and a very mature political economy uh, only emerges as the most natural destination for the global market players to set up shop uh, in, in the second most populous country, which uh, over the next, not just five to ten years, but over the next uh, three decades, uh, see, uh, will appear to be the growth engine uh, for the world. Thank you.
just to share with the audience here, uh, these, uh, this presentation copy will be made available by UKIBC. And should there be any more elaborate questions, of course, the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, we'll be very happy to receive all the questions. Uh, but uh, even if uh, some of the detailed queries are directed towards uh, understanding more on India's economy and the prospects going forward, we'll be happy to respond to them even via email. Many thanks for that excellent overview, Dr. Rao. It was indeed very helpful. I will now ask some questions we received. The first question is, what are your views on the recently released uh, GDP data? Thank you. Uh, as I said, uh, India has uh, shown a sharper recovery in its economic growth prospects over the year, uh, last two years. Uh, in the interim, we have also embarked on a global standards of measurement of economic activity. So GDP in the new series is an improvement in the sense that it has a wider coverage. The method is more in line with the global standards and global practices. And when I said coverage, the coverage of many more corporate entities has got in, uh, uh, enclosed in the results and in the tracking of e level of economic activity. If we look at the recent data, yes, there have been uh, concerns of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, disconnect between the high-frequency data points and the annual uh, and the GDP data released by the government. But I would like to just say, suffice it to say, that uh, aggregate of high-frequency uh, indicators uh, going forward uh, as and when the annual results of most of the corporates are made available to the government will see India see a growth over 7%. We can debate whether it is going to be 7.2 or 7.5 or 7.6, but the fact of the matter is that has India shown an improvement in growth traction to our mind? Yes, because from a 7%, we're likely to see a 7.3 to 7.5, and if what we just spoke of does indeed play up, uh, uh, you know, India is likely to touch an 8% growth. So uh, there are some concerns, but notwithstanding those concerns, I think it's more the direction and not the magnitude uh, which should be uh, of concern, and direction is fairly robust. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Our next question is, the attendee thanks you for the presentation and asks, that much of the improvement in deficit and boost in reserves has been funded due to the low oil price. Would we have seen similar positive figures had the oil price been at $120 per barrel instead of the current $30 per barrel? And despite the positive developments, powerful initiatives and global interest, there hasn't been much improvement in the INR currency. Where is the INR headed compared to the US dollar and Great British Pound, and when will the currency actually improve? Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, I think that's an oft, uh, uh, oft uh, aired question and concern that uh, what if uh, crude oil had remained at $120, uh, would India's uh, uh, deficit ratios have looked better, or uh, uh, would our reserves would have looked better? Uh, to my mind, I think yes, uh, definitely commodity prices, uh, 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 dramatic decline has come at a very opportune time. But let's not forget, uh, uh, you know, fuel uh, prices in India's uh, inflation basket uh, uh, has a very low weight as compared to uh, about 10 or 11 percent is the fuel basket weight. So in terms of implication of on uh, India's inflation, uh, you know, we we would have seen perhaps uh, uh, a rise in by about 50 basis points on inflation. Uh, but I think more remarkable for inflation story here, as I spoke of earlier, was food. So if crude oil prices were 120, the impact would have been on current account gap, that is the trade deficit. On trade deficit, 
uh, given the crude oil price decline, uh, you know, we also would have, uh, we have also seen a similar or equivalent decline in our exports of uh, crude oil related uh, petroleum products. Now, if crude had remained at 120, our exports would not have dwindled by almost 18 to 20 percent that we have seen in recent times. Uh, more importantly, uh, 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 you know, so uh, the impact would have been on trade deficits. So what we lost in terms of our exports is what we gained in our imports. So I think on trade deficits we wouldn't have seen a dramatic uh, uh, impact. Um, the third is on budget deficits. Yes, no doubt we had uh, embarked on, uh, 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 you know, subsidy regimes. Uh, which I would say have systematically seen the government actually, uh, you know, migrate a lot of the petroleum product prices in alignment with the global prices, and uh, we did see a huge subsidy saving uh, of over about a lakh crores, but a large part of it still remains within the government. We have not seen a lot of it getting passed down in the hands of consumer. Uh, to counter it, we have seen effective deployment of these subsidies uh, by the government on capital expenditure by the government. And that is the reason why, yes, hypothetically, we can raise concerns about has government been uh, singularly uh, lucky. Uh, you know, I, I would think that uh, I think it's a debt uh, administrative management also, and some sound policies. And let's not look at uh, let's look at it from the flip side. If if in India had to bear with a hundred percent plus in terms of oil, uh, you know, we would have been able to disinvest a lot of government oil uh, uh, firms, you know, which were in fact in the pipeline, which in turn would have bridged the gap on the budget finances. So we would not have seen those concerns on budget deficit also. In terms of your rupee question, I think we have seen a sizable build-up in reserves of 350 odd billion dollars. Uh, RBI's policy has been, uh, you know, that of maintaining this momentum of build-up in reserves uh, based on the uh, fundamentals, real fundamentals. Uh, what RBI has been successfully doing so is, uh, you know, broadly moving in the direction of the real fundamentals. Uh, so we have seen Indian rupee weaken versus dollar. Of course, the uh, the extent of overvaluation is higher than the current uh, uh, weakness that we are seeing in rupee. But if you adjust it for the productivity differentials, I don't think the gap is alarmingly big in terms of the spot level of rupee and what would have been otherwise uh, dictated by the real effective exchange rate. Uh, having said, we envisage that rupee should broadly trade to a dollar in the range of 67 to 69 uh, through the next 12 months or so, uh, 12 to 14 months, and we do see limited uh, 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 risk, uh, of course, in this highly unpredictable uh, world. We do have to spell out the risk, and the two key risks would be what if, uh, you know, China once again embarks on rapid uh, devaluation uh, and also uh, what if the complete global growth engine collapses? Now, these two are the uh, risks that uh, we would like to pinpoint. But barring these two risks, Ceteris is paribus. I think we should see 67 to 69 to a dollar in the coming 12 months. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Thank you. That was a really insightful answer. The next question is, much has been said about the GST bill and we all await its implementation. However, in your view, are there any other reforms that can have a similar impact on the Indian economy? Well, I think India has come a long way from the Big Bang reforms announced in 1991, uh, where India went through a comprehensive restructuring of its economy. Since then, India has adopted more a piecemeal and a, uh, an approach of being a gradualist as far as reforms are concerned. To be honest, India really doesn't need a, that level or that degree of comprehensive reforms at this juncture. But definitely, as I said, taxation is one area where uh, perhaps India needs to uh, you know, embark on a big bank reform like a GST, a goods and services tax. Uh, as far as the foreign direct investment is concerned, 
uh, India has been uh, uh, India has been uh, you know systematically op opening up its sectors to global players right from 49 percent to 100 percent. Uh, so one is the GST. The second, as I talked of, is the bankruptcy code. India has does not have a strong bankruptcy code, which would allow and facilitate both the banking sector in India as well as to an extent the corporate sector, which has gone through unforeseen, uh, uh, you know, negative shocks, so to speak, uh, to allow them to, uh, you know, declare bankrupt. The moment you allow bankruptcy code to come in, you know, there is a way to unlock that inefficient capital and deploy it more efficiently. So I think the second big reform that I would like to see after the GST uh, or rather even before GST, because GST is going to be between center and following which all the state governments will embark on. But bankruptcy code is one that would probably be an all pervasive and easier to tackle reform in the very near term. We always remain hopeful of the, the next re set of reforms, which are going to be on land and labor. Land, the government has actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, allowed the state governments, the subnational governments, to set up their own set of rules to allow uh, the land uh, acquisition bills to create a new ecosystem, how they're going to, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, acquire land and help, uh, the, help the dispensation get more efficient uh, for the uh, displaced labor, displaced farmers, or displaced uh, facilities. So I think that's going to be left to the different state governments. Labor reform, uh, I must admit, is going to be perhaps uh, on, on a slow track mode if I were to look at the very near term. But as I said, uh, early days yet, uh, who knows, over the next two years, we could see a lot of these reforms getting uh, uh, completely embarked on uh, uh, in, in over this span. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rao. Our next question is, how is the corruption view and its statistics in India? Has it improved? or worsened, what are the steps India is doing to fight corruption? Well, I think uh, co corruption is an all-pervasive indicator across the globe. And I I would just like to add my comments in, in a more, uh, uh, not as a professional economist, but as an observer, uh, as a citizen of India here, that, uh, you know, uh, it's unlikely to get completely weeded out overnight. But what can be done is create an ecosystem, create a transparent and a predictable framework for policies and rules in every sphere of uh, uh, economy, which will allow uh, the room for interpretation, varied interpretations, and therefore room for corruption, uh, you know, uh, eventually getting weeded out. So I think the clear uh, set of rules that need to be created are in the areas where you currently see uh, weak governance structures, uh, you know, areas like uh, um, housing, for instance. We have seen systematic improvement in the environment and greater confidence in the hands of consumers, uh, you know, to, to see a uh, lesser degree of corruption. So I think it's going to be an evolution. It's going to be a process, not. Uh, and as I, if, if I may be allowed to use a quote straight from, uh, you know, uh, a highly placed government officials, what they say and they have been saying is the number of people making trips to Delhi to get their, uh, you know, licenses reviewed has dramatically reduced and declined. And that is because the government is in the process of and has already in many spheres laid down clear-cut policy uh, rules uh, which, uh, you know, help the investors and various economic stakeholders, uh, you know, to have uh, unambiguous guidance about their investment decisions. Thank you. Dr. Rao, the last question is, Given the current slowdown in the European Union, will this have an impact on FTI flows into India from the EU? Well, I think uh, EU as a uh, source of foreign direct investment has not 
been very significant uh, to start off uh, to start off with uh, it has been uh, within eu we can say germany has been the larger source of uh, foreign direct investment and that to a lot of it in automotive sector which is already coming to india in terms of incrementality or the new players uh, i think uh, every investment would want to find a value buy and uh, and the prospects of growth and the prospects of sustainable growth uh why definitely in in as as you rightly said uh, when each of the region is grappling with their own domestic growth engines all the more reason perhaps for uh, a lot of the global players to seek uh, you know relatively profitable avenues for investments and uh, their investments remaining profitable over a period of time not just a short term and for that i think foreign direct investment offers a greater opportunity and while uh, you know sequentially you know we may see some kind of uh, correction uh, uh, in in terms of uh, uh, foreign direct investments coming from regions where there very very weak growth has dwindled their domestic appetite but uh, as i said uh, you know a larger part of our foreign direct investment has been getting rooted through singapore and mauritius so uh, at this point in time and uh, in in so far as our data points are concerned i think india has actually seen an improvement in foreign direct investment flows over the last 2 years despite what is happening globally thank you thank you dr rao for the excellent overview and interesting insights thank you very much for your time you. and i hope this webinar was valuable to you if you have any feedback or comments about today's session or a session that you'd want to see us do in the future please feel free to get in touch i would also like to invite you to visit our website and check for the webinars that we are organizing as part of our access india series a program designed to support uk businesses through short online sessions on a variety of topics Our previous Access India webinars are also available to watch at any time. You may also wish to look for the Access India hashtag on Twitter to join the discussions. Thank you for joining us.